from the very first time your baby puts her hand around your finger, the first time she learns to walk, the first time you watch her with sheer joy and laughter running, the first time she writes her name, the first time she learns to ride a bike. These motor developmental milestones are both humbling and inspiring at the same time. The value and the enormity of movement is something I don't think as humans we fully comprehend or understand. Movement provides us with access to learning, behavior, performance in our everyday lives. So why are we doing less of it? Movement starts in utero. The first connectivity is established between the physical sense of self and the environment around us. When we are born and the full force of gravity takes over, we begin to realize that we can connect our thoughts with our actions. With enough stimulation of our touch systems and our motor systems, we begin to realize that our bodies belong to us. Then we can explore the world. The physical sense of self then it lets us understand where our bodies finish and space actually begins. This concept of space helps us to understand directionality. Directionality helps us understand orientation, and orientation helps us lead our lives where we can develop organizational skills. We quickly learn to move and think, and in so doing, we begin to establish an understanding of what is right from wrong, what is cause and effect. For example, in Scotland, it's not very warm. <laughs> it has been said in Scotland we have two seasons, July and winter. <laughs> I can tell you, if you're a Scotsman, this is not true. Scotland is beautiful. You should come. But in Scotland, we have the heater on, the radiator on the wall during the winter months when it's cold. And the baby is very intrigued by the noises from this machine. So it crawls over. And just as it's about to touch the radiator, its mom and dad says, no, 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 no! And an act of pure defiance, or maybe in an act of exploration, the baby touches the radiator and then goes and then scurries back to mum and dad for a hug, for safety and for reassurance. The next day, the baby is in the room and once again, the heater is making a noise and it thinks, yeah, I'm going to have that. <laughs> and so it crawls once again all the way over to this radiator and just as it's about to reach out and touch the heater, the mom and dad say, no, 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 no. And the baby says, wait a minute. I think I remember something yesterday. I, I think I'm going to leave that thing alone. But in reality, knowledge for that baby, for that child, has been constructed because of her active experience in the world. And in the absence of those active experiences, children don't learn to move and think. So they don't learn to cope with life and all that life throws at them. If, therefore, there is a delay or a limitation in physical development, therefore, there are detrimental influences, negative influences, on that child's ability to learn, to behave, and to perform in everyday life. So if the child does not develop that sense of self, they no longer understand space. If there's no space for them, then they don't understand directionality or orientation, and they can't lead a life that's organized. These children are often the children who have learning and behavioral difficulties diagnosed. Or they are the children who are disenchanted with the wondrous process that is learning. Or, in fact, they're the intelligent, capable child who underachieves because they're having to compensate for these physical limitations. That's a disaster. 
So if there's none of this available to the children, what does it look like? Well, in our schools, we recognize this as the child who cannot write on the line, often writing above, below, and sometimes through the line on the page. Sometimes the letters are huge for the child, and sometimes then the letters are very small. The children who can read very well, but cannot fully comprehend the passage that they have just read. In the world of sport, it's the competent child performer who has very good skill, but cannot read, anticipate, and react to the speeds and the pace of the game. If you're a child who cannot move with flow, with rhythm, and with poise, you move very awkwardly, and it's instantly recognizable. As a result, you are much more susceptible to ridicule and teasing from your peers, which negatively influences your self-confidence, your self-esteem, and your self-worth. So children who therefore find it very difficult to move decide to move less, and this only makes their troubles bigger. We need to increase children's ability to move, to encourage them to move more, to help them out of the difficult situation that they're in. So how do we identify these children? In my practice, I have many different assessments that I use. Tests for balance, postural control, coordination, both gross motor and fine motor control, eye muscle control, and so on. Once I have a physical developmental profile of the child, it's very interesting to then ask the child to do a range of drawings so that I can try to evaluate what is the impact that their physical limitations are having in other areas of their life. One of the most informative tests is the drawing, the freehand drawing of scissors. The blank piece of paper is placed on the desk in front of the child in portrait orientation. The scissors are then placed on the desk above the paper in an open position with the handles nearest the child and the blades away from the child. The child is asked to draw the scissors with as much attention to detail as they can. It's not timed, so they can take their time, and some of them do. <laughs> By the age of five years, we should expect to see circles as a representation of the handles. We should see a connected cross, and we should see some representation of the bolt in the middle. As we can see from these three examples, despite their ages, these children have not yet developed those skills. What's really fascinating is I have had the honor and the delight of working with these three children. And what they all have in common is as babies, they never crawled on their hands and knees. When I ask them to march like a soldier or to skip with an arm swing, they move the arm and leg on the same side of the body at the same time and in the same direction, creating a lack of integration from one side to the other. So their physical sense of self is broken down. So therefore, that child's ability to move and think isn't as good. Now professionally, I am coming across this more and more often with the children that I have the pleasure to meet. Children are simply not developing in the way that earlier generations did. And as a result, they are not able to move and think in the way that we can. But can we? Moving and thinking is tough. I wonder how physically developed our audience today is. Can you please point your fingers at me? I'm glad everybody has fingers. This is always a good start. <laughs> I want you to make four circles to your right. One, two, three, four. To your left. One, two, three, four. Away from each other. One, two, three, four. Towards one another. One, two, three. Point them at one another and make them go in opposite circles. One, two, three. Oh my God. <laughs> so we have the, uh, the delusional adults in the room. Yeah, I've got this. <laughs> so let's take the hardest one, because I'm like that. I do want you to go in opposite directions, but this time 
I want you to have to think also. I would like you out loud, no cheating, to start with the number 65 and count back in threes at the same time. Go. 65, 62. It's very quiet in Slovakia, have you noticed? <laughs> <laughs> somehow, uh, somehow after today, I don't think I'll be invited back to Slovakia. <laughs> the power of movement is a very strong thing. This is an example of a young lady that I have the sheer joy to work with, to work for, in Scotland. On the left is her picture before we started work with her. And you can see that not only are her scissors separated, there's no bolt anywhere, and actually her scissors are also upside down. Following seven months of some motor training that we're working on with her, she's beginning now to grasp the concept of that physical sense of self, so her understanding of space and so on is better, and you can see her scissors are starting to come together. And it's nice that she draws better, but actually the most inspiring thing is the feedback from her parents, who say she's much less clumsy now. Her balance and posture is much better. Her speech and language has really dramatically improved, but more importantly to them, she's a happy, confident little girl. In December 2018, she was five years and 11 months old. I think it's remarkable that something gets to that stage in life before the right help is available. World, we need to wake up. Of course, not everybody can afford private therapeutic treatment. So our schools are perfectly placed to really inspire and support our children to learn, to behave, and to really perform to their very best, to be the best that they can be. Physical education is a great lesson. It's perfectly set up to develop children physically. But in order for physical education to succeed, it needs four key ingredients. Ingredient number one, the children must achieve moderate to vigorous physical activity for at least 20 to 40 minutes in every lesson in order to open out the reserves of cognition that they can access. Key ingredient number two, we must make sure that the motor tasks we ask of the children are complex, they're difficult tasks, because then they're able to tap into that cognition we've woken up to really allow learning and behavior and performance to progress. Third, we need to give direct stimulation of executive function skills, the highest level of cognition that humans are known to possess. Things like focus of attention, working memory, inhibition control, to name but only a few. And the fourth key ingredient is learning must take place. In society, do we have a solution? Well, in Scotland, we have one. Because as we all know, Scotland is God's country. <laughs> but in Scotland, we have developed something called better movers and thinkers. This is a step change in physical education, where rather than focus on the sports-specific skills, we begin by making our children move and think better. We give them a physical task at the top of the cycle, then we add a cognitive task on top of that, we then stimulate those executive function skills, and then we check in to make sure that the child has remained actively engaged in the learning process. A very quick example, we might give them a four-arm pattern, one, two, three, four, and they have to learn this pattern. Then we kind of break it up that they may do one hand, then the other hand, and then they do both. And then we really mess them up. We make one go to one, but one go to two at the same time, and then they follow each other around in a pattern that just looks bewildering and amusing at the same time. But the whole point is the complexity really captures the fundamental optimism that goes with learning and behavior and performance. Of course, schools cannot be the only people who really need to then change movement opportunities for children. Society needs to be shaken up and needs to do better. The World Health Organization has clear guidelines for children aged 5 to 18 years. 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity every day of the week. At least three of these days should be spent in vigorous physical activity. And more importantly, we need to reduce the amount of sedentary behavior that our children go through. In other words, sit less, and move more. There are easy ways to achieve this, cost-effective ways. For example, the active commute to school. Don't drive your child to the school. Maybe drive some of the way and walk the rest. Not only do you increase their physical activity level, but you have more time to talk and interact with your children. A very beautiful thing to do. Model the behavior that we're looking for in our children. 
Show them what it's like. This doesn't just have to be from parent to child. In fact, older siblings showing and demonstrating it to younger siblings is much more effective. It's no surprise that children's learning behavior and performance is influenced by their environment. Think back to the story of the baby crawling towards the heater. This is a beautiful picture. I have three beautiful girls, Hannah, my oldest daughter, Kayla in the picture, and Amelie. I go to Dubai, I work in Dubai every six weeks with families out there in schools. And this is, uh, I took Kayla when she was eight years of age to come and see Dubai, to experience something other than Scotland and to educate her on what the big yellow thing in the sky is. <laughs> as you can see, <laughs> as you can see, the walk from the metro to the Dubai mall, Kayla chooses to walk in the middle of the floor. But if you look at everyone else, they're using what Kayla called the moving floors. So when you model the right behavior, you do generate good choices for your child. But if we want our children to change, we have to change too. Adults don't move enough. It's very simple how we can do this. Walk to work. Drive some of the way. Walk the rest. If you get on a bus to walk to work, get off one stop earlier and walk in. And then start one stop later to go back. Walk to the shops and carry your shopping home. Do your own gardening. Put some really lively music on in the house when you're dusting and hoovering everything. Get it a bit of vigor and a bit of go. Your house will sparkle and you'll feel great. <laughs> so there are very simple changes we can make. If we do have to take our car to the shopping center, we'll park it the furthest space away. <laughs> then you've got lots of steps into the shop and lots of step back again. Apart from that, it's really easy to park. <laughs> In a world where children and adults move less and stress more, we need to change the value and the importance that we place on movement. Every child born in this world deserves the right to the best life possible. It's our job to create more movement opportunities for them. It's our job to move more frequently with them. It's our job to model the behavior we want our children to do. Because then we give them exactly that. We give them a choice. A choice to live the life they want to have, not to have to just accept the one that they have. Now surely every child in the world deserves that. Thank you so much. <laughs>